So the Form T1 is finally back. I've been looking forward to this updated revision for quite a while now, as many of you have. And here we have both of the new models. So you can actually build the T1 in two different modes now, essentially two different hardware layouts. Today I wanna to go over which one is the superior layout in terms of performance, and also discuss how the T1 is shaping up against your current ITX options. So a quick recap here, this was one of my favorite ITX cases of all time for quite a while. I ran my personal rig in there for a long time, which had a liquid cooled 28. ADTI, and I've done a few builds in it demonstrating the seriously good thermal performance for just a 10 liter case. Build quality is just unmatched from anything else out there and the designer is just an absolute fanatic when it comes to hardware and volume optimization. Think of like a Tetris Grandmaster but for PC components. Now when the T1 arrives on your doorstep it'll actually come flat packed like this. All of the beautifully CNC'd and anodized parts which I definitely have to take a second to appreciate and focus on here. The build quality really is just incredible. Formed have truly gone above and beyond with their attention to detail and getting things looking perfect. Really appreciate that. So yeah, you do have to assemble the case yourself, but for the T1, it does kind of make sense. I mean, this thing is just so customizable that if you just pulled it out of a cardboard box, you really would lack the knowledge of how it's put together. And that would affect your experience later on when it comes to fitting different sized components and different coolers. Not to mention, it's just really satisfying working with these nicely machined parts, kind of like a super premium Lego set. The one that I'm building here is the reference kit. Color is called titanium, which looks like a light space gray. I think we take for granted how hard something like this is actually to achieve on a production level, which is why most companies don't even bother. But man, it really does look insanely premium. I know I keep saying that, but it truly is just a big step up from whatever PC case you might have built with in the past. Now there is a user manual on the line, which shows pretty well how to assemble everything for both layouts. We might do another step-by-step -step build in the T1 in the future, but for this video, I kind of wanted to do a bit of a deeper dive on performance and the airflow differences. The reference kit is pretty interesting though. One of the side panels actually doubles as a motherboard tray. And as you can see, the result is something that looks like an even more compact end case M1. So that's kind of the goal here with this newer reference layout that they're offering with the V2. It allows you to build with much larger air coolers compared to what you can do with the sandwich layout. In this case, we've gone with the 115 mil tall Noctua C14S, and this is the largest option. It also means that you don't have to use a riser cable with the GPU, which is pretty neat but it does now mean that you are limited to only reference sized GPUs. So two slots in thickness, but with a pretty generous 325 millimeters in length, basically that means that you're looking at founders edition cards and two slot workstation cards. So the finished build then looks pretty epic. We've got a Ryzen 5800X 3D in there called by the Noctua C14S, Corsair SF750 Platinum for power, and the Nvidia RTX 3080 Ti Founders Edition up top. I've also added a Fantex T30 fan to act as exhaust right next to the flow through fan on the GPU. We've seen how well that can work in previous setups, and here it does make a pretty big difference as well. So yeah, really big fan of how this is looking, but how does it compare to the V2's sandwich layout? Well, to be honest, not much here has changed. Uh, it's still the same case for the most part, but just improved a little bit further. So graphics card compatibility has been extended by a few millimeters and you can fit slightly larger graphics cards. You now have support for dual radiator custom loop builds if that's something that you ever plan on doing in the future. But probably the biggest improvement is the further granularity that you have between kind of expanding and minimizing the different volumes for each compartment. So one of the biggest features of the T1 was the fact that you could switch between a two slot and three slot GPU mode. And the whole idea here is that if you're running say a two slot GPU, you can kind of shift that beam over and open up a bit more clearance on the CPU cooler side and run a slightly bigger CPU cooler. And consequently, it will allow you to run bigger GPUs. If you have a three slot GPU, then you can open up the GPU side and then run a slimmer CPU cooler, or maybe even like an AIO with a slimmer pump block. But now you just have insane control over those different volumes. I mean, it really is just an extreme amount of control to perfectly dial in your build. For example, you now have a CPU cooler height range from 48 millimeters up to 88 millimeters and a GPU thickness range from 1.25 slots up to 3.25 slots. So whether you're running a single slot water block or a thicker 3.25 slot RTX 3090, you can optimize the volume on the opposite side. So let's take a look at what I've done here then. I've set things up with a 68 millimeter cooler 
Rawhide and room for a 2.25 slot GPU that allows us to run the Noctua L12 for our CPU and then some 5mm standoffs for the riser cable just to offset the GPU from the motherboard a little bit more. And so by opening up that GPU chamber just a tad more, this should make our top exhaust fans slightly more effective. I've then also used 20mm standoffs for the power supply to offset that from the flow through fan on the 3080 as we've done with previous builds in the T1. And in the end, I mean, we've got a pretty interesting comparison now. We've got mostly the same components in the same case. We've got the same volume, both 10 liters, just organized differently when it comes to the interior. And there's a pretty big performance difference between them. So let's start with the GPU thermals. RTX 3080 Founders Edition in there, running Heaven 4.0 for 45 minutes. And in the sandwich layout, it levels out to around 77 degrees. This is with the GPU completely stock, no undervolt, power tuning, or fan speed changes. And so considering that, it's running pretty good. The reference layout, on the other hand, that runs noticeably warmer. There's about six degrees separating them on this chart here, but in reality, the difference is much greater than that. For starters, the GPU's fan speed ran 22% faster on the reference mode, which is a much louder setup overall. And when we take a look at the clock speeds, we can see just how much that setup is actually struggling. Again, green plot here shows the sandwich build. Clock speeds there for our 3080 are pretty typical of what you'd see in any build. Nice and stable at about 1870 MHz. The reference build though runs about 5% lower clock speeds on average due to running much warmer overall. Once you start hitting that 83 degree mark, that's when the GPU steps in and starts to dial things back. It's also worth mentioning at this point that I've tested in a temperature controlled room set to 21 degrees. If you live in a warmer climate, 26, 28 degrees indoors for example, those clock speeds are just going to continue to drop lower and lower. The sandwich layout will get warmer as well, no doubt, but at least there you've got proper exhaust airflow which is is evidently more effective. You can lean on that a little bit more, turn the fan speeds up, for example. GPU undervolting is also a lot more effective in that setup. By locking the GPU clock to 1875 megahertz at about 880 millivolts, power decreases by about 45 watts, GPU temps drop by a further six to seven degrees, and our fan speed drops by over 300 RPM. I'll leave a guide on how to do this down below if you're unfamiliar with it, but yeah, it can be really, really effective and you don't lose any performance. Now, of course, I did try undervolting in the reference layout as well, but it just wasn't anywhere near as effective since we're already right up against that thermal limit. It will make an improvement, no doubt, but nowhere near to the extent where it becomes a setup that I would actually recommend. Something else that's pretty interesting to look at here is how the CPU temps are affected when that GPU starts heating up. On one hand, you've got a much beefier heatsink in the form of the C14S, although it's sharing the same compartment as the 3080. And on the other hand, you've got a slimmer cooler, not as powerful, but in a separate chamber along with some active cooling right above it. And while they both start off looking the same, the difference eventually grows to about seven degrees between them. So despite the reference layout having the larger and more capable cooler, our 5800X3D actually runs warmer in that configuration when it comes to gaming loads. Now, neither of these air cooling solutions are a good idea. If you're putting your CPU through some heavy extended load like rendering or encoding, for example, then you'd probably wanna opt for a liquid cooling setup or simply a bigger case. We can see here though that the C14S is slightly more effective than the L12S when GPU temps aren't a factor at least. I mean both of them kind of have the 5800X 3D topping out at 90 degrees C but the C14S takes longer and does cool off a bit quicker. It's not to the point though where I'd recommend going with that configuration overall because I don't really think it enables you to do anything different. So if you're looking at the T1, pretty much just go with the sandwich layout. It just wins on all fronts. I honestly did expect the reference kit to do way better than it did, but I guess you can't really argue with the results. And taking a closer look, I guess it does make sense, right? Two active fans versus just one, two separate chambers for cooling, simply is the better setup for airflow. So the Form T1 is an extremely good small form factor case, but we can't ignore that this thing here also exists, right? This is the Dan A4H2O. Uh, it is the direct competitor to the Form T1. This one is housing my fiance's PC, which I guess kind of explains the pink coolant. Previously, this was a green custom loop that I did. Some of you might remember. I will link that down below. But yeah, I do think that this is the way to go for most people if they are looking to build a super compact gaming PC. For the most part, these cases are extremely similar in layout. The main differences being that the A4H2O is one liter larger in volume, is $100 cheaper, but has a much more rigid approach to build 
building. 3 slot GPU and 240mm AIO for the CPU. That's really the only way that you should be building in this thing aside from a custom loop. I do honestly think though that that covers like 90% of what most people want to do with a modern ITX gaming PC, which is why I think it is the better choice overall for most people. On the other hand though, the T1's build quality cannot be beaten. I mean, it's been optimized and tweaked to an insane level. It allows for a ridiculous amount of playing around. For example, that offsetting that we did for the 3080 FE, that simply is not possible in the A4H2O. There you'd be best to stick with open air cards only. And yeah, that can enable you to do things in this tiny form factor which you just can't do in the A4. But the choice here is basically whether that stuff that you actually care about and how much money you want to spend on a case. Both options are extremely good, all things considered, and I'll leave them linked down below. So as always, a huge thanks for watching. Hopefully this video helped you out and I'll see you all in the next one.